All right. Um, well, let's start with um, any questions, anything anybody wants to go over, especially um, related to PA3. So had some people in office this morning, had some really good questions, got through some good stuff. So let's keep that going. Yes. So if no argument is specified, try to open 20q.txt in the current directory, just whatever directory opens without a path. And if um, if anything goes wrong, just, you know, say can't open file and you can just exit at that point. Got it. You can also assume that the file is perfect. I will not give you a corrupt file, so you don't need to do error checking. Um, you can assume, you know, the first line will be Q colon or A colon. Um, so if you check for things beyond that, that's totally up to you. What if the tree is empty? The tree will not be empty. It's always guaranteed to have at least... Um, three nodes, uh, an initial question and a pair of answers. <clears throat> and that, that actually takes care of a few edge cases. So this, this is an, um, this is an assignment where I'm not really trying to make your code break. Right. I'm really going to try to play your game. Um, I'll, you know, make sure the computer guesses wrong and make sure it updates the tree and stuff like that. But but um, if you can play the game, you know, read from a file, play the game, update the tree, write it back to a file, you should be good to go as far as the behavior of the program. And then the uh, the only other unknown in your grade is, you know, comments and stuff like that. All right, keep thinking of these things as objects, right? So, so I've seen um, a number of, of people who've shown me their code and they're still kind of doing a mix of Java and C. So, you know, the C style would be to, um, for example, call a, a traverse method and pass it the root of the tree, right? An object mindset um, approach to that would be to make the traverse method part of the node class and then just say, you know, root.traverse. Um, or something like that. So if if things aren't feeling quite structured the way you would like, um, that may help to uh, to kind of go back and think about things in terms of, am I really treating these things like objects? Am I encapsulating the code and the data in these classes? And um, you know, taking advantage of the fact that this is Java. All right, well, let's go on to PA4 then. Um, and so this has been posted for a few days. Let's, um, let's just jump into it. So PA4, you're going to implement a game. Um, this is gonna be uh, graphical, so it's gonna be um, something that, you know, you play on a computer and you use your mouse to make moves and so on. So this is the game of dots. And it, it's got other names as well, but I grew up knowing this as dots. And it's a really easy game for two people to play. Um, all you need is, you know, pencil and paper. Um, but we're making a computer-based version of this game. So let's, um, let's see how this game plays out. So typically what you do, you and a friend, you start off and you draw a grid of dots and we'll just do a 4x4 four four grid but you know depending on how much time you're planning to kill you can make this large and um, one person goes first and each time that somebody moves they draw a line to connect two dots that are next to each other 
and you can either draw vertically or horizontally. You're not allowed to connect diagonal. And you just take turns, you know, each turn you get to draw one line. So I might draw this line, and my friend might draw that one, and I'll draw this one, and my friend draws this one. Okay, so here's, here's the trick. If you can draw a line that completes a box, you win that box. So it's my turn. I could draw a line here, I could draw a line here or here. But if I draw this line, I will get this box. So maybe I'll go ahead and I'll draw that. When you win a box, you put your initial in it and you get to go again. So I'll go again, I'll go right here and maybe my friend will go here. And, and maybe I'll go here because I'm not a very good player at dots. And my friend will say, oh, I'm going to go here and complete this box. So they put their initial in there. They get to go again. Hey, they'll draw that line, complete this box, put their initial, they get to go again. And then they'll go there. I'll go here, they'll go here, I'll go there. They go there. So sometimes you can draw a line and end up completing two boxes at once. That's legal. So if it's my move and I draw a line from here to here, I've won both boxes, I put my initial in both, and I get to go again. And so you just keep playing like this until all the boxes have been completed, and then whoever's got the most boxes, they win the game. And then you go ahead and you play again or whatever. So that's, that's the basic game. And your goal in PA4 is to write a Java program that will let two people, two humans, play this game on a computer. So you're not playing against the computer, you're not writing a program that figures out which boxes to complete and so on and so forth. You're just creating an electronic version of the pencil and paper, basically. Darn, I thought we were going to make an AI. Well, you know, you could add extra features. <laughs> um, I've never actually studied the strategy of dots. Um, and as I was doing this one, I'm just thinking you can leave some, some low-hanging fruit where if somebody completes a box, it actually works in your favor. But, um, but that would be interesting. But yeah, so for PA4, PA5, we're just going to use the computer as a way to play dots, um, electronically. So, um, let me show you... Yeah, right? <laughs> Oh, really? Cool. I don't know where I learned this from. I mean, I, I feel like I've known it all my life. And when I was in college, I discovered one of my best friends also knew how to play this game. So in, like, really long lectures, sometimes we'd pretend that we were, like, sharing a textbook. But we'd be playing dots in the margin, you know. Um, bad habit. It's funny, back when I was a kid, that we had a DOS program, because that's how old I am. Uh, <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, that was the one. And, and they had this game on there. That's where I learned how to play. Really? This one, uh, That's cool. Like three or four. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hmm. Was it one of these? All right, so let me let me show you. Um, oh yeah, that was definitely. Okay, cool. <laughs> let me show you some sample executables. So I've got my own version of this. I've got a series of class files in here. You want your program to be able to run from the command line. You're going to develop it in Eclipse, but it's got to run as just a standalone um, class file. So your main class is going to be called dots. So I'm just going to say Java dots. And that should go ahead and and start the program. And it's it's a graphical um, program in nature. So um, two players get to play. So you know we can do Yoda and and uh, Darth because they're buddies. And um, nothing happens until you hit the start button. So if I try to make moves, it says click the start button to begin. So hit the start button, and um, it's currently Yoda's turn. So. To draw a line, you basically just click, you know, between the two dots that you want to connect. So there's a move, and there's a move, and there's a move, and it's alternating. This is Darth, this is Yoda, this is Darth, and so on. So Darth goes, they get this box, they get to put their initial in the middle, and it's still their turn. 
They can complete this box, put their initial in the middle, and it's still their turn. And this is keeping track of the score, 2-0. to zero. And then they might go over here, and Yoda will go here, and so on. And so you keep playing, and eventually, you know, all the boxes will fill up. And, um, and then it will announce who's won. And while I'm running this, I've got debug information printing out, right? Telling me where the mouse click occurred and, and what it decided from it and so on and so forth. But all of the gameplay should take place from this window, right? I shouldn't have to do anything in the command line window. So the other thing that you want in here is a restart button. So, you know, Yoda gets upset and says, ah, oh, let's just start over again. You can hit the restart button and, and completely uh, begin the game again. That's true. So you can add options to this, and, and one of my suggestions in writing the code is don't hardwire things like 8x8. Eight eight. Just use some variables to say how big the board's going to be. And then when you're developing, you can test, you know, like a 4x4 four four version or a 2x2 two two and see what it does when the game's over, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't want anything that requires anybody to do something different from the assignment. But you could add a switch, for example, where you could say, you know, dash um, 5, you know, or just put an argument 5, and it would take that as the board size, kind of an undocumented feature. Um, that would be totally cool. Yeah, yeah. So I just tweaked my code and changed my box size to three. So should have made it two. I don't actually know if this works. I've never tried playing it to the end. If it throws an exception, it's not my fault. <laughs> actually, it is. We're going to let F win, whoever that is. There you go, F wins, game over. And, hey, incredible. And then you can, you know, change the player's name if you want. And, and once you start, I've got these boxes grayed out. So you can't change your name halfway through. In case you're losing, you can't suddenly, like, take the other person's name. All right, so that's, that's the basic setup. So the, the details fill out the assignment prompt, but that's basically what you're after. All right, so um, you're going to implement your own version of this. Um, you're going to use Java, you're going to use Swing to do the windowing, um, and you're going to try to keep you know, good object-oriented design in mind while you're doing this. It's going to be essential because the Swing package is fairly complex, drawing um with swing is fairly it's it's straightforward once you know it but it's it's still got a lot of of parts and pieces so you're definitely going to want to be in that that pure object oriented mindset um instead of you know kind of procedural code um so now i'm very excited based on the just the introduction alone i know it's like the greatest game ever <laughs> All right, so um, so I suggest working in Eclipse because you can use Window Builder, which makes the the um, the design of the interface a lot simpler. Um, a lot of the boilerplate code that you need for you know creating mouse listeners and frames and panels and all that gets written for you. Um, and I don't really want you to get bogged down with the nuances of you know. Um, what are the properties I should set in a, a J frame to make it look reasonable and so on. So um, whatever you do, your code has to work as a standalone set of classes, right? I want to compile your .java files, then I want to say Java dots, and it's got to run. So if you get into anything weird, if you try to use, you know, some other IDE or, or some kind of fancy window manager or something, make absolutely certain that you can just copy your Java files into a completely empty directory and then from the command line Java C all your Java files and then Java dots to run. 
All right, so it allows two people to play dots on a single computer. Um, so you're sharing the mouse, right, taking turns clicking on it. PA5, we're going to extend this, and it's going to make um, a network connection between two instances of the game so that you can play with somebody remotely. So it'll be the, everything we do in PA4, but with a network component added on top. So that'll be your last programming assignment. All right, so here's a rehash on dots. So a 2D grid of dots, um, 9 by 9 dots in our case, which is an 8 by 8 grid of, of uh, boxes. And you take turns connecting the dots. If you complete a box, you put your initial in, and you get to go again. Otherwise, it's the other player's turn. You alternate till all the boxes are filled, and whoever has the most initials wins. All right, this is a group project. So you can work alone if you want, or you can work in groups of up to three people. So you can work with one to two other people. It's your choice. You're allowed to work with people in the other section, so I'm fine with that. You'll have to coordinate, um, you know, who's going to, um, to do the presentation. If I'm going to have presentations, I'll probably um, leave presentations for PA5. But... Um, Pick your groups as you like, but I strongly recommend, number one, make sure everybody in the group does the entire project, right? It's a group project, but I don't want you to split up the work. Because you're trying to learn, you know, more object-oriented design, you're trying to learn swing, you're trying to learn event handlers, how to do um, event-driven programming, how to paint on a panel, and so on. Um, everybody needs to know those things for the exam and for, you know, future things in your life. So, so even though it's a group project, I really don't want you to say something like, um, I'm going to handle all of the, the user interaction, you handle all of the graphics, and this other person will handle making the code look pretty and putting in comments, right? That, that may get you, you know, a good grade on this assignment, but it's not going to help prepare you for the exam and for future courses. So make sure that, that you know, you're doing the whole project um, as an individual. But because it's a group project, what does that mean? It means there's people you can get help from in your group. You can share your code with people in your group. You can work on code together. You can bounce ideas off one another. You can get stuck. And say, you know, how did you handle drawing when the person clicks? And and your partner can, you know, show you code or look at your code or, you know, help you debug your code or things like that. All of that is legal now, right? So you can you can take advantage of the group aspect in that way. But but don't take it to mean I don't have to learn swing because my, my group partner is going to take care of that part, right? So make sure you're... you're understanding the entire project and at least capable of doing the entire project um, the other logistics is make sure that only one person submits their tar file so when I grade these I'll usually go through you know either in the order in which they're submitted or alphabetical order or something but but any tar file I find I will potentially grade and if I download a tar file for three people and I grade it that's going to be the grade for the group and if later on I come to another tar file and there's a note saying, you know, grade this one, don't grade so-and-so's, right? Too late, I've already graded the other person's. So coordinate amongst yourselves. Make sure only one of you turns in the tar file. And then the other, the other detail, make sure that every group member's name, full name, is in the top of every Java file. Right, so make sure everybody in your group is named in every Java file. That's that's what I'm going to look at to decide who gets credit for um, for the code that I grade. All right, requirements. Your program should begin by drawing a grid of dots, so it'll draw it, you know, on on a a window. Um, it should be eight by eight boxes, so it's actually nine dots by nine dots, because you know, fence post problem. Um, the boxes should be 50 by 50. Again, I want that to be the size, but you can put that 50 into a variable like box size. And you can put this 8 into a variable like number of boxes so that you don't have too many, you know, random integers floating around your code. Plus, it's easy to change. You know, if you want to play a 100 by 100 game where the boxes are like 4 pixels wide, 
you could just change your variables and recompile. All right, pair of text fields where people can enter their names, a start button to begin playing, um, some way to keep track of whose turn it is and display that information, um, and then responding to clicks of the mouse by drawing lines. Um, assuming that the line is not already drawn. If you click on a line that's already been taken, um, don't, you know, let the user take that as a turn because that's an easy way to cheat. So if, if this is what our board looks like and I click the mouse right here, you know, show me a message saying, saying, you know, illegal move or just ignore it, you know, and leave it in my turn until I click somewhere where there isn't a line already drawn. Out of curiosity, when you say event handling, it, I mean, my only experience with games is Unity, and they do like start and update. Uh -huh. Is that pretty similar to what we're doing, like the update method? Unity does events too. Yeah, it will. It will be somewhat similar. Um, we'll get to that in a few minutes, and and it's it's um, the painting in particular. Um, we're going to use repaint instead of update, okay. but but similar idea. Okay. All right, um, each time that a line is drawn, the game should notice if, if a box or more than one box has been completed by that move, and if so, put the current user's initial in the box and um, let it be that player's turn again. Otherwise, switch. Keep track of the score. Report the score somewhere on the playing field. A J label works great for that. Um, and then once all boxes are complete, the game should say, you know, that it's over, and it should say who won or say that there was a tie. Um, there should be a restart button that you can use at the end or during gameplay, and an easy way to do that is just change the start button to say restart, and then, and then, um, you know, just repurpose what the code does. Alright, so how do you do this? We're going to go through, um, a high-level view of how you might set this up, and then over the next few classes we'll dig into the details. And there's a lot of details here, right? One detail is... Um, you know, we've seen we can set things up so that when you click the mouse, we get the XY coordinates of the mouse click. But if I get XY coordinates right here, how do I know that that means I should draw this line, right? If I get XY coordinates right here, how do I know that I should draw a vertical line between these two points? So we'll talk about all of this, and we'll talk about um, how to, to do the mechanics of actually drawing lines, writing initials, and so on and so forth. But let's start with kind of a high-level overview of, of the general gameplay, right? And so this is, this is one way that I approach this. Um, you don't have to do it like this. Um, but, but as usual, you know, I'll be talking about this particular approach. And I believe if you follow this approach, you'll find a fairly easy path through this assignment. Um, but it's certainly possible to do this other ways. It's possible to structure it differently. And, and whatever is making sense to you, right, go for it. Um, and this isn't the next render, it's the week after? This is a week from, uh, this is two weeks from tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this, this is um, very different from most of the code we've written um, in class. Most of the code we write, you know, is a series of steps and first do this, now do this, now check this condition and either do this or that, now call this function, take the return value, add this thing to it, now go back to the top of a loop, right? So it's, it's usually, um, it's something like, you know, do this and then go do these things and then come back and do this and go back up. That's the usual kind of C code we write or the code we've written so far in Java. The CPU is always executing one of our instructions right if this is you know next line it's waiting for the user to hit enter right or if it's a call to f gets or something um if you've done engineering 270 you had one lab that was very different from this where you had a series of lights and they were blinking in a particular order and then when something happened something we called an interrupt this sequence would pause and one of these lights would turn on for a few seconds. And then when that was done, it would go back to blinking. 
But in that sequence of blinking, there's no word that we check to see, hey, is there an input coming in on pin 10, right? We set things up ahead of time. We create an interrupt handler, and we turn on interrupts. And then when an event occurs, in the case of 270, when a voltage is applied to a pin, we suddenly jump to our interrupt handler. And a lot of the code that we write in 270, what's the main program that we do? We say loop, go to loop. Our main program is just spinning its wheels, not doing anything. And that's what's going to happen in Java when we do things with Swing. Most of the time, our main program is going to do a few setups, and it's going to say return, and that's it. It's going to exit. And so we don't have code that we've written that's sitting in a loop waiting for a mouse click, waiting for somebody to make a move, and so on. Instead, what our code is going to do is set up what's called an event handler, or an action listener, um, and we're going to say things like, hey, if the mouse gets clicked somewhere in here, let me know. If the start button gets pressed, let me know. If somebody types in this box, let me know. And we're just going to basically arm a bunch of events, and then we're kind of, kind of going to go to sleep. Our main program will exit, and Swing will just kind of hang out in the background. But then, you know, if somebody comes along and clicks the mouse, suddenly our code's going to be running. It's going to wake up, it's going to start executing some section of code, it's going to give it information about the event, like the XY coordinates where the click occurred, and our code will do something. And then when our code is done, it'll go back to sleep. It'll return. And so everything that we do in our program happens in response to events. And that's, that's a different way of thinking about programming. It's a really powerful way. And if you've, if you've done game design, this, this will be somewhat familiar to you. Um, because that's, that's how most of these game engines work. Right? You, you wait for a certain amount of time to pass, or you wait for um, a button to get pressed on the controller, and then you do things in response to that. So this is event-driven code. Um, along the same lines, we're going to talk more about painting later on today. Um, painting is, you know, this business of actually making a line appear or making a letter appear. We don't get to do that wherever we want, right? Theoretically, when the mouse gets clicked, right, we get a click right here, we find the XY coordinates, we figure out there should be a line here. That would be a great time to say, hey, computer, draw a line between this point and this point. We don't get to do that, right? With swing, we have to be very, very well behaved in how we draw on the screen. And the reason is, you know, everything is trying to draw on your display. Right? Right now I've, I've got, um, you know, a terminal window and I've got a little area of pixels up here that are alternately turning green and black. And I've got some pixels over here by the letter N that are shaped like a red arrow and and are, are you know moving around from time to time and I've got a little progress bar up here that's slowly creeping over which means some of these white pixels are going to turn black in a few a few minutes um, everything is trying to write on your display and if you simply allowed you know a program to say hey go ahead and, and change these pixels from this to that your display would look horrible Right, so there's there's a very disciplined system that we have to follow for doing what we call painting, for drawing on the screen. And so that's that's gonna be different, right? Because when you click a mouse, we're not gonna be able to say paint a line. All we're gonna be able to do is say, hey, when the the screen gets redrawn, here's what I want to have happen. So that's gonna be a different mindset too. Alright, so um key concept here ask a lot of questions right this is a new way for some of us about thinking about programming there's there's some heavy machinery here swing is a a complex package with a lot of classes in it um and so not everything that we talk about is going to make sense the first time through everything i just said about painting might sort of sound somewhat reasonable but it might might raise more questions than answers right 
um, that's okay. Um, we will hit these these ideas over and over and over again. We'll develop lots of code. Um, but you've got to do the same thing on your side, right? You've got to take these ideas and work with them. You've got to be writing sample code. You've got to be testing out some of these concepts and be thinking about, you know, how am I going to use this to, to make a dots game? And you want to start coding as soon as possible, right? Um, if you put this aside for a week and, and don't start it until, you know, a week from Friday, it's going to be a really hard time particularly if you have not done event-driven code, if you haven't done uh, graphics output and so on and so forth, because there's lots of concepts to learn here. But if you can find a way to work on this, you know, a little bit each day, that's going to serve you really well. Pick, pick one thing that, that we go over in class and, you know, say, okay, I'm going to spend an hour tonight just trying to work with that concept. That's fantastic, right? That would get you a lot of time practice on the coding and the more of these concepts you nail down the more you can use them to figure out the other concepts so a, a consistent effort is going to work better than than a mad dash at the end um, at least for most people so concentrate on one thing at a time um, if you understand the building blocks of this putting them together will be will be fairly painless and will actually be pretty fun um, all right, so um, you're almost certainly going to want a class named Box, and and with most things like this, there's always a, a notion of what's the real focus of of um, of this program. So so a few years ago, I was writing a uh, program to do like a stenographer's version of basketball, so you could you know with one hand record what was happening in a game. Um, and then play back a transcript later and coaches could look at it and see, you know, what their players are doing and so on. And, and I tried a few different versions of this and it turned out the key to that was following the ball, which seems kind of obvious afterwards. But at first I'd been trying to follow individual players and then I was trying to follow, you know, which team was in control. And it turned out if you followed the ball, that showed you, um, you know, what information you had to record. And, and if somebody wasn't involved in handling the ball at a particular moment, it didn't really matter what they were doing. Um, so with this game, the key is following the boxes, right? And, and even though it's about dots and it's about a board with a bunch of dots and initials, really everything comes down to a box. And so what is a box? Well, you can think of it as um, something with a row and a column and four corners and each corner has an XY location and it's also got four sides which we can think of as top bottom left and right and it might have an initial saying who owns the box and these are really the most important aspects of a box so your sides can be represented by booleans and you might you know have four booleans top bottom left right and those indicate whether or not a line has been drawn on that side of the box an initial might be a character that that stores the initial of whoever owns the box and if the four sides have not been completed then then the initial can just be blank and so, so if you think of a box like this, right, how do you construct a box? Well, set your four sides to, to false and set your initial to blank. You've got an empty box. But now your entire game board is just an array of boxes. So you can make a two-dimensional array of boxes. And assuming that, that box, uppercase B, is a class, and you could say something like box board bracket bracket equals new box bracket eight bracket eight and that constructs a two-dimensional array of boxes and now if the person has clicked you know in box in in row five column three I can get to that box by saying board bracket five bracket three 
So this is the row and this is the column. And this thing is a box. So if they're trying to click on the bottom of the box in row five, column three, I can say, let's check board bracket five, bracket three, dot bottom and see if it's true. If it is, that line's already been drawn, so ignore the click. If it's false, let's go ahead and set it to true. And now we've recorded that there's a line drawn at the bottom of that box. So think about the box class, right? And, and this becomes almost the only real class you have to build other than your main class. The only real class you have to build is, is the box, and it's a really simple class, right? It's really just kind of a placeholder for some objects, but you can put some code in there too. Um, so that's, that's one suggestion, right? Make your board a 2D array of boxes. Boxes can have booleans for the four sides. Um, and a character to indicate whether the box is owned and who owns it. And from there, you can sort of build up the entire game. All right, so obviously modularize, right? That's, that's my mantra this year. Um, if you're doing something more than one place, consider putting it into a separate method. If you're doing a lot of different things in multiple places and they always work with the same types of objects, consider making a separate class. But I'm giving you no requirements on classes or methods or anything here except the main method has to be um, in a class called dots. So you get, you know, complete freedom to structure this however you like. But some things you might think about doing, right? Make a method for initializing the game board. Well, when you first start running the game, what do you have to do? You have to construct an array of boxes. You have to make sure all of the, the booleans are false. You have to make sure all the initials are clear. You have to make sure the score is 0-0. Zero, zero. You have to have some turn counter that says it's player one's turn. You're going to have to do that when the game starts. You're going to have to do that when the person hits the restart button. You can throw all of that into a method. When the person clicks, they're going to um, trigger a mouse event, which is going to call some set of code and give that code the XY coordinates of the click. There's a lot of stuff that happens after that. You need to know if that XY coordinate is legal, meaning is it inside the game area, and is it referring to a line that's not already drawn? Well, you could make that a method. And then you could say, you know, if not legal, parentheses, X comma Y, return one line you've taken care of of illegal clicks right they still have to write the legal method but in your your mouse handling code it's a one-liner if xy is not a position for a legal move let's just return not do anything else so think about how you can break the tasks into into pieces if your mouse handling code is you know 200 lines of java it's going to be real unpleasant to work with that especially if you're finding bugs, right? So, so punt, right? Take, take the thing that, that you want to do and make a method to do it and then just call that method. And, and then later on, you know, change hats, go off and write that, that lower level method. I noticed when I was doing uh, the Unity C sharp, when I was, kind of taking one of the classes and, and learning about that they said that anytime you have something that is more than like 10 lines of code that is handling one function you should always take that put it in a method and then just call the method right there mm -hmm. the event handler yeah so i've i've heard advice like that and and as a rule of thumb it's probably not bad um but sometimes um you might have you know a longer chunk of code that um, just happens to take a lot of time, like if there's a lot of user interaction or, or um, a lot of, of little details that need to be set up or, or adjusted in response to something, you might find a longer section of code in, in um, the middle of a method, and you could put that into a separate method, but it might actually make things more complicated to do that. Um, and And... 
I'm thinking of, of some code I was looking at this morning and the person was trying to modular, modularize it and they would have had to create a method where they passed a bunch of things to this method and then did some manipulations and then came back and it was a lot of code but it would have made the piece they were working on more complex to uh, to work with because you'd have to go off and find this function and see what it does and and logically it all kind of was doing one thing so um, so yeah not a bad rule of thumb though right if if you're seeing long sections of code it's a good place to at least look and see does it make sense to break this into um, into something separate yeah I think the biggest thing was if you're writing code for like uh, moving a character mm -hmm. that all takes place in the update method and mm -hmm. so you don't want to stack all that in there and make it look you know not pretty right and right take it, put it in a separate method and then in the update you just call that method and then it will do all that code perfect and yeah then, you know, and that that i think makes sense from from a functional perspective right this is a a separate um action that should be happening here and that's that's another good way to to suspect that maybe this should should get put into a different module all right cool um so um another thing to keep in mind is um you know when we write code in c or or other objects that aren't um, other languages that aren't object oriented um, functions are kind of a pain right you've got to prototype them and you've got to pass you know a bunch of information to them because you're not supposed to use globals and so you know if you want a method to do something you'd have to pass all the stuff to it and you can only get back one return value or you have to return a structure and and that kind of stuff but with with objects, right, methods become really kind of, of straightforward to use, almost as straightforward to use as variables, right? Because when we when we make a structure, it contains variables and see when we make an object, it contains, you know, variables, properties, but it also contains code methods. And and they they look and feel the same. Really, the only difference is the method has parentheses after it and maybe arguments. So we can take advantage of that, and and I give an example in here, um, which is which is um, dealing with the score, right? So somewhere we're going to have you know player one, player two, or maybe you'll have their names, and this person's got fifteen boxes, and this person has seventeen boxes, and you've got your mouse code, and the person clicks, and they draw a line and they get their initial and now you need to say hey player one now has 16 boxes and so you know inside here I could update the score or I could you know call something that's going to try to change this 15 to a 16 and so on um, and you know when we when we start the game over I need to reset the score to zero zero and and there's there's you know lots of stuff that goes on with that and I could have a pair of variables player one score player two score they could be integers and and you know every time that I complete a box I could increment one of those scores and if I want to know who won I could see which of those scores is bigger than the other and when I want to restart a game I could set both of those to zero right but but this is making more and more stuff that I need to keep track of and so imagine instead that I wrote a method called player one score. And it takes no arguments and it returns an integer. And I could make a board class and inside that board class I could declare my 8x8 array of boxes and then inside this board class I could have a method called player one score well what would this method do it would go through the array of boxes and as it goes through it would check each box's initial and if that initial belonged to player one it would increment a counter 
and at the end it would return that count. Well now I don't have to keep track of the score. I don't have to update a variable every time someone claims a box. I don't have to zero out a variable every time that we start the game over, right? The score is a f artifact of the board. Right, just like when you play dots with a friend, you probably don't actually, you know, keep track of, you know, how many boxes each has. If you want to know who's winning, you look at the board and you see how many initials does each person have. And when the game's over, you count up how many initials each one has. Well, our program can do the same thing. And so, player one score would not be a variable that's, that's stored anywhere, it would just be a method. And similarly, you know, player two score would be another method. And then I might make a method called update scores. And update scores would call player one score and then, you know, display that number here and then call player two score and display that number here. And now any time that that somebody's turn is done before I exit, all I have to do is say update scores. And if no new box was claimed, that's okay. Player 1 score and player 2 score will be the same as they were, and these numbers, you know, will appear not to change. And if somebody got one box or somebody got two boxes, makes no difference, because update score will call these two methods, which will count the number of boxes, figure out how many boxes are owned by each, and then update score will display those here. So part of the idea of modularizing is, is um, you know, kind of passing the work off to somebody else. Ultimately, someone has to do the work, but let's not do the work more than one time. And, and um, so, so that's an idea, and there's, there's an update score example here. Um, all right, so mouse clicks... Um, we know that that when you click we can get the xy coordinates we're going to have to decide what do we do in response to that click so let's draw an example of a board here so here's 0 50 100 150 here's 0 50 100 and suppose the person clicks right here. And, well, let's, let's put the click right here. So this is at x equals, you know, 110. And y equals 55. And so somehow we need to decide, hey, if there's a click right here, are we trying to draw this line or this line or this line or this line or what, right? And, and we'll go through some math for this, but, you know, basically, um, we can find a shortest distance to this line. We can find a shortest distance to this line, a shortest distance to this line, and a shortest distance to this line, and see which one is closest. I drew this awkwardly, like, on the diagonal. Does but. This... Do you have to implement it this way? Like, if they're clicking... Like, I was thinking, if they're clicking on anything other than a line between two points, it would be an illegal click, and then just wait for the next click. No, you want you want to be more uh, gentle than that with your player. So they should be able to click, you know, pretty close. Now, you could say, you know, if, if you're the same distance from here and here, I'm not going to take that as a move. You can insist that they're closer to one line than the other. But, you know, certainly if they click right here or here, it should pick up that line. But but all we have to do is figure out, you know, what's what's the distance from here perpendicularly to this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, see which one is closer. And if you want to be fancy, you could say if, if it's, you know, at least, you know, three pixels closer to this than to any other edge, we're going to say, okay, this is the line you're trying to draw. And then you have to figure out the coordinates of this corner and that corner. And if we know the row and column of this, we can do that. 
And then once you know those those coordinates, then we'll use a method called draw line. We'll give it these x y coordinates, this x y coordinate, and it'll draw the line for us. All right, so we'll we'll go through that, but basically you have to decide which side they they clicked on, and then act accordingly. Either draw the line and check for a box being closed, and so on and so forth. Um, and keep in mind that you know if if the person has drawn this line, we're going to set this box's top variable to be true. Well, you also have to go into the box above you and set that box's bottom variable to be true also. Because most lines you draw belong to two boxes. But, you know, if you take this line right here, there is no box above us, and so don't try to take the box at index negative one and set its bottom equal to be true, because you'll, you'll get an exception. So there's some edge cases to deal with too. But once you can respond to a mouse click by, by turning on the booleans and the appropriate boxes, you've got the hardest part done. All right, so drawing the board, after a break, we're going to talk about how to paint from swing. And that's going to be a kind of quirky approach if you haven't done this before. Um, but the punchline will be... Um, we don't really do a whole lot of drawing on the display. Mostly what we do is we update memory. Mostly we update booleans inside this array of boxes. And when the screen gets painted, it will look at this array of boxes and using those booleans will decide where to draw lines. So this is this is a data driven mindset, which is another another recurring theme with objects, um, letting the data um, control what the code does, instead of explicitly you know trying to do things like draw a line or fill in an initial, update some data and let that be used to um, to update the display appropriately. All right. And, and in all seriousness, once you get this, this sort of lined up, it's a lot of fun, right? It's, it's a graphical output. You can, you know, point and click and see things happen. You can show this to friends. Um, and it, it starts to be a lot of fun. Once you get past, you know, sort of the initial part of, of the curve of how do I set up a frame? How do I paint? How do I respond to events and so on? Um, but when we get through those, right, then it's, it's Lego, it's Minecraft, it's, it's putting things together and getting cool stuff done. Um, so think, think about the structure of it, right? Um, and again, you know, what exactly is the right way will vary from person to person. Um, but, you know, you can start with some of the things we're talking about in here. Um, Keep thinking about objects, keep modularizing, use good variable names. There's going to be a lot of information to keep track of in here. So don't call your scores, you know, A and B or S1 and S2. Um, use a name like, you know, score of player one, score of player two, something like that. Um, and yeah, um, deciding what classes to make is definitely um, a big part of the challenge for object-oriented design. Um, you almost certainly want a box class. As you start thinking about the things you do with boxes, I believe that will lead you to believe you need a board class also. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done without that, but yeah, a board and a box class are probably um, going to show up in most people's solution. Um, and you're going to have a bunch of classes related to drawing, but those, those are classes we're going to use from Swing. Those aren't things you're going to be writing from scratch. Um, all right, grading is super straightforward, right? If I can download and compile your files, 15 points. If the game starts and draws some dots and shows a score of 0, 0, you get another 15 points. Um, if I can enter my name and it uses my initials, that's 5 points. Um, if it responds in any way to mouse clicks, you get 15 more points. So just having a handler that, you know, you click the mouse and flames come out of my, my keyboard, that's another 15 points. Um, 
then um, if it actually reliably draws the lines where it's supposed to, that's 20 points. So that's a biggie. Um, if it catches illegal moves and does not accept them, that's another 5 points. If it um, notices when a box is complete and adds initials to those boxes, that's 10. If it switches turns correctly between the two players, that's another 5. If it reports a score and keeps updating that, that's 5. And the restart button is another 5. And then submission, um, your main class should be called dots. You can have as many pieces to this as you want. You want to take all your .java files, put those in the tar file, upload that. And make sure your code runs outside of Eclipse. Now, if you have a Linux system, you can just, you know, like I said, copy the Java files to an empty dir, compile them, say Java dots, it should run. Um, if you have a virtual box, you can do that also. If you don't have a Linux system set up that you can try this on, um, you can try running it on the Linux server, and it won't actually display, but if it's, if it's set up correctly, it will give you a message like this saying that, you know, it's trying to do a display, but it, it doesn't have access to a display. Um, if you have an X server, which, you know, every machine should, but doesn't, um, you could go ahead and do an SSH-X to the Linux server and run your code on the server, and it would display on your local device. Um, and that's, that's another way to check this. But, you know, your best bet is just have, have a Linux machine somewhere in your group and um, just try running a standalone from there. All right, that's that's a long five pages. Um, this is an assignment that's that's easier to do than to talk about. Um, so any questions so far? All right, let's do a five minute break. And um, we come back, we will um, start playing around with Eclipse some more and look at some of these swing components and look at drawing on a uh, component. And if you have PA4 questions, we can talk about those after break first. Um, but let's go ahead and come back in about five minutes.
Microphone. Audio, video. All right, we're back. All right, so I think I cut someone off at the end there before a break. So is there another question or comment? I forgot about it. Okay. I'm sorry. No problem. All right. Well, let's um let's jump back into Eclipse and take take a closer look at Swing. Go through this a little more carefully. Um so I've got hopefully a stable setup. I just have to find it. So I think this is the version of Eclipse I set up on Tuesday. So here's here's our main window. Um, let's go ahead and start a Java project. I think we installed VWrapper last time. Is that true? The VI plugin. Yeah. Okay. You you can also um, if you right click on your source file, there's like a reveal and file explorer, and then you can use whatever editor you may like. Oh right, right. Cool. Awesome. Um, you can also, so so you can customize this like a billion ways, right? So you can go under window preferences. Um, and there's, there's various uh, options you can set, but there is a dark mode. Um, it, it works well in some ways. Um, but, Designer is broke though. Yeah. If you look at it. So, so this is not like wonderful to me because it's it's not really a dark mode. It's kind of a a faded out mode to me. Um, but as I said before, sometimes if you set this up yourself and you adjust the colors, you end up finding that you know something really critical is the same color as your background. And and I had this happen once, and the only way I could undo it was to. To click a menu option that I couldn't read because it was the same color as my background, and and it was it was a bad week. So, um, but you know, here's a darker mode. Um, so let's do a file new Java project, and um, we'll just call this stuff to play with. And um, to work with with Swing, right? We're going to right click on here and say new, we'll come down to other, we'll go down to window builder and expand that, swing designer, expand that, and we'll make a new J-frame. And um, I'll call it main. Um, when, I, when I keep talking about using the default package, this is what I'm talking about, right? If you fill in this box, then you start um, putting your files in um, a directory structure, um, which is really useful for code that you're going to Put out in the open for other people to use, um, but it's it's unpleasant for somebody grading, right? Because then I have to navigate this this file system, which will be different for each submission. So for this class, we're using the default package, which you know is discouraged with a yellow exclamation mark. Um, but we're going to use the default anyway, and it's just going to dump all of the class files into one directory. That's what I really want for the sake of grading. So we're going to leave this box blank even though it's it's trying to get us to to do something. Um, so I'll just call this this main and I'll hit finish. And we've got our usual code that's been created for us and we can run it and we'll get our, our JFrame. Alright, so um, we played around with um, the design window and we looked at I think adding some buttons to this and responding to button presses and so on um, 
And we also played with capturing mouse events so we could see where where a mouse was located. So let's let's start doing something like what we might do in PA4. Let's start um, let's start trying to draw some stuff and and respond to clicks. So I'm going to do this this thing that I mentioned last time, which is I'm going to use an absolute layout because right now if I take a button and I try to drop it on here, it's going to force me to put it in one of five boxes. And you know, if I put it right here, I get this big wide button, right? And that's that's not really what I wanted. So we're we're going to circumvent that, and um, and I'm going to click this thing that says absolute. It's a layout manager. I'm going to come in here, get this little green box and a plus sign next to my arrow. I'm just going to left click. And what that's going to do in my source code, it's going to add this line that says content pane set layout null. And it means that when I drop something like a button in here, it's going to go exactly where I drop it. So I can put it anywhere I want. If you want to use a layout manager, you're welcome to, to play around with that. Um, the idea of a layout manager is if you're, you're running your program, I'll say always save. If you're running your program and you resize your window, you'd like your your things in that window to usually move around in some reasonable way. If I had a button here and a button here, maybe when my window gets wider, I want this button to first button to move over here and the second button to move here. And if my window gets really skinny, maybe I want one button here and the next button below it. With an absolute layout manager, none of that happens. First button will be here, second one here. In this case, I wouldn't see the second button at all. With with a layout manager, you can arrange for you know how these things should be placed, perhaps relative to the edges of the frame or relative to one another, and so on. But it's it's an additional complication to figure out. And for our dots game, we don't need that. Right, because I'm I'm telling you to make the boxes 50 by 50 and the board 8 by 8. So your playing area is 400 by 400, and that's hardwired. And so just make your frame big enough to include a 400 by 400 playing area, and you know whatever buttons you need, and so on and so forth. So we're good with an absolute layout manager. Um, so let's let's take a a look at. How this is set up, we have a J frame, and if I click on this, um, it's it's hard to tell, but if I click on J frame, it will take this box and put it around the entire window, right? So this whole thing in here, that's my J frame, and inside that, there's a thing called a content pane. So if I click on content pane, I get this smaller window that's surrounded by a border. That's the content pane. And the content pane is something called a J-panel. And a J-panel, roughly speaking, is a swing component that can hold other components. So it's, it's a container that we can put things into, such as buttons and text fields, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I could put a button over here that might be like my start button, and I could put some text fields that would hold somebody's name and I can put some labels on these maybe like you know this is player one and this is player two and you know it, it does a reasonable job as I move these things around it's it's showing me some lines you can see a vertical line that appears when I get this label lined up with a label above it you can see a horizontal line that shows me where I am relative to that text field and like right now I'm lined up to the bottom of it and here's a nice center spot and so on so so this might say player one name player two name you could type your names here and here's a go button and so on and so forth all right so maybe maybe this is a first stab at my board um, I'm going to want a drawing area and if if you remember from our mouse listener code when we were playing around with picking up mouse locations, right? If if we put the mouse over here, we were getting something close to zero zero. 
And if I'm going to have a playing field like right here, it's going to be most convenient if the upper left corner of that field is 0, 0. So I'm actually going to put another J panel into my window. I'm going to put it right there and it starts off really tiny. So I'm going to grab a corner and make it bigger. And this should probably be, you know, exactly 400 by 400. I don't know if I can fit it. But I can go to the source and, well, stay in the design window. So this object right here is called panel. Um, and if I come into my source and I look at panel, well, here's where the panel's constructed. It's a new J panel. And set bounds, here's the XY location, here's the dimensions of it. So I can change this to 400 and change that to 400. And now I've got a 400 by 400 board. So I can make my J frame big enough to hold that. And maybe I'll move it up a little. All right, so there's there's my game set up, right? And if I run this, well, I don't get a whole lot exciting going on here. But there there is a J panel in here. You have to believe me on that. Um, so I can I can come in here, right? I've got the J panel selected. So you can click on things in here and select different objects. And this window over here will show you what object you clicked on. So this is something called text field one. This is the thing called panel and its properties are down here. While the border is blank, I can click on this next to border and I can put a border on it. So what kind of border should we use? Well, we can use a bevel border because that that's always kind of fancy. And now if I run this, we can see the playing field. Now we haven't written a lick of code yet and we've already got something that looks you know fairly fairly complete and this is pretty typical for these kinds of systems so um, so J frames and J panels and and again the sort of general setup is the J frame is the whole thing there's a panel inside that frame this whole area here that's holding different components like buttons and labels and text fields and is also holding another J panel. And you know, you can type in the text fields, doesn't do anything. You can click the button, doesn't do anything. You can click in here, doesn't do anything. But this is this is our setup, right? All right. So, let's talk about painting. Our our goal ultimately is, you know, to draw some dots in here and then respond to mouse events. So so let's just try to draw something in here. Let's just try to draw a rectangle. Right? Just make something appear in this area. And so we're going to use a class called graphics. And graphics is is a thing, it's part of the Abstract Windowing Toolkit, AWT. It's a thing that lets us do graphical output. And it's got all these great methods like draw a rectangle, which draws, you know, a rectangle. Draw a round rectangle, which draws a rectangle with rounded corners. Draw a polygon, draw oval, draw a line. Um, and there's fill versions, right? We can say fill polygon, fill rectangle, and so on. We can set colors. Um, we can set what's called an XOR mode, which is something we can do for animations, and a bunch of bunch of useful methods in here. So let's just play with this draw rectangle, and this basically takes an XY coordinate for the lower left corner, oh, sorry, upper left corner, um, and then it takes a width and a height. Actually, I think that's lower left. Um, The question is, where do we get a graphics object from? Because if we just construct, you know, graphics G equals new graphics, there's no reason that's going to be connected with anything in particular. It's 
this J panel, that J panel, this J frame, the rest of my display, right? We need to somehow get a graphics object associated with this J panel. All right. Well, if you look at the documentation for a J panel, which is also all of these other things, there's a method in here. It's an inherited method, um, and it's called paint. So it gets inherited from component. And paint is a method that is called with a graphics object. And the description says, invoked by swing to draw components. Applications should not invoke paint directly, but should instead use the repaint method. So here's the setup. Periodically, or aperiodically, swing will call the paint method on our different components. This thing here is a J panel. It has a method called paint. When necessary, swing will call that method. And when it calls it, it will pass it a graphics object that if we use that graphics object to say fill a rectangle, will fill a rectangle in this area. But we don't get to call paint ourselves. What we can do is we can call repaint. And repaint tells swing, hey, you need to repaint this component when you get a chance. And it won't do it right away. We'll call repaint, it'll come back to us, and sometime after that, swing will call the paint method. All right, well, what does the paint method do? Well, in the case of, of this J panel, it draws a dark line here, it draws a white line here, it puts some gray inside here, and so on and so forth. It paints this object. What we want the paint method to do is draw a little rectangle in the middle of this. But we also want the paint method to draw this nice beveled border and make the inside gray and so on and so forth. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make our own version of a J panel and we're going to write our own paint method. So the, the fancy way to describe this is we're going to make an extension, we're going to extend the J panel class. And then in that extended class we'll get all the stuff that's inside a J panel, but we'll write our own graphics method. Sorry, our own paint method. All right, so so multi-step process, right? We're going to make our own class, which extends a J panel. We're going to write our own paint method in that class. And then we're going to say that this thing is not a J panel, it's a Nick panel, right? And the Nick panel class will look very much like the J panel class. It'll have all the same stuff from a J panel, but it'll also have this different version of paint, which says, hey, let's draw a rectangle. All right, so what does this look like in practice? Um, let's go ahead and click on this J panel. And right now it says it comes from Java Swing J panel. Well, if we look in our source code, what is a panel? Um, and let, let me change the name of this because we're going to have too many panels kicking around. So let me, let me call this um, my board. All right. So this thing is, is an object called my board. And instead of calling this a J panel, let's call this a super cool panel. And we'll say this is a new super cool panel. And it's, you know, giving me some complaint here because super cool panel cannot be resolved to a type. Well, I haven't defined what a super cool panel is yet. So let's let's create a class called super cool panel. So I'll I'll right click on the project, I'll say new class. And I'm going to say this class is called super cool panel.
and I'm going to use that extends keyword and say super cool panel extends J panel. And I'll, I'll click on this and it'll say, you know, J panel can't be resolved. I'll import um, Java X dot swing dot J panel. So that works fine. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of the dark mode because. That's just not working for me. Wonder what classic looks like. Just try this. I just want something where we can actually read the uh, the words that are written. I hope I didn't just break my Eclipse install. I don't have any pop-ups. All right, I'll assume this is good. All right, so um, we've got a J panel, right? It doesn't like this because I'm not I'm not um, setting up this static final. Don't worry about that. Um, let's go ahead and do what we want to do now. If I don't do anything right now, if I just say super cool panel extends J panel, um, and in my my design window, I've I've got a super cool panel down here, right? This should this should work as is hmm. well that's an unpleasant oh there we go okay right so all of these methods do exist as part of a super cool panel why because a super cool panel is an extension of a j panel Right? So everything that's in a J panel is in a super cool panel. And so I can do all of these these method calls. And so if I run this, this should look, you know, exactly the same as it did before. But it's not a J panel anymore. It's it's an instance of my class called a super cool panel. Oh Yeah, go ahead. It's a J panel and a super cool panel. It is, yeah, in the sense that it's also an object. All right, so let's let's make this thing do something different. Let's make a graphics method. So this is going to be public void. Um, sorry, let's make a paint method. And paint takes you know a graphics object G. And let's let's just play around with this. Let's make let's make a paint method, but let's count how many times paint gets called. So I'll set an integer count equal to zero. And every time I go into paint, I'll count another another time that I've gone into paint, and I'll just print out a message saying I'm inside paint and here's what the count's equal to. And it doesn't know what graphics is because I haven't imported it, so I'll import uh, graphics, and so that's that's all set up. And so let's let's go ahead and run this, and we've got our our console output that'll appear here on the bottom. So let's go ahead and run this, and I've called paint twice, and you notice my my nice beveled border is missing. Um, that's okay. Now, if I resize this window, it keeps calling paint, right? Why is it doing that? Because when the window changes size, 
potentially that component has to be redrawn. Maybe part of it is missing. Or maybe, you know, things are supposed to grow bigger in that window. Um, and so swing is the thing that's calling paint, right? And it will do that multiple times. Sometimes that's necessary, sometimes it's not. And if I minimize this and then maximize it, I'm never going to find it. Right, it called paint again. So paint, paint is being called um, by swing. But inside paint we have this graphics object. So let's, let's go ahead and use that. And let's just say g.fill rectangle. And we'll just fill a 200 by 300 rectangle at 100, 100. And if we run that, hey, there's our rectangle. All right, so that was, that was a long, wordy discussion for what ended up being, you know, a couple of lines of code. But the, the concepts are critical here, right? So inside our main window, instead of creating a J panel, we're creating our panel, right? A super cool panel in this case. Everything else is exactly the same, but by doing this, we can define our own paint method in this, this class which for us is going to, you know, tell us how many times it's been called and it's also going to draw a rectangle. All right. Well, that that was a, a lot of work for seemingly little result. But this really gives us like like the hook we need to do a lot of other stuff. So let's do something that that is not really proper but it's kind of fun and then we'll we'll come down to this business of what happened to our beautiful border why aren't we seeing that nice beveled border around here um but let's let's hook together mouse events and graphics objects um so let's do mouse events plus drawing so go into your design window i'm going to right click in here i'm going to add an event handler and I'm just going to put a handler for mouse motion. Um, so when the mouse gets moved, I want to run into some code. And my code here is going to be, um, you know, my draw, or, you know, draw a rectangle, and I'm going to pass it an XY coordinate pair. So I'm going to do um, E dot get X and E dot get y and my goal is to draw a rectangle wherever the mouse is and so in the mouse motion I'm gonna say you know let's let's draw a rectangle well I can't just say draw a rectangle here right I don't have a graphics object that I can use to say fill rectangle um, the drawing happens inside this object's paint method. So if I'm going to do any drawing of a rectangle, it's going to have to be done inside here. So I'm going to make a method inside this. Called draw rectangle. And I'm going to call that method inside my mouse handler. So what's my super cool panel board called? It's called my board, so I'm going to say my board dot draw rectangle. With an uppercase R. All right, so so far what's what's happening? When we move the mouse, we'll come into this this handler right we'll we'll call this mouse move method we'll pass it this object e e dot get x get y will give us x y coordinates of the mouse and i'm going to call a method in my board called draw rectangle that's this method here which doesn't really do anything all right so let's let's do something
Let's just print out X and Y. So I can move my mouse around and I'm seeing my X and Y coordinates. Right, my rectangle, I drew it around 100, 100, and I can see that. And 0, 0 looks like it's, you know, pretty close to here. And if I go outside that, I don't see anything being printed out. Why? Because that's outside my board. Right, my board is a 400 by 400. And if I get outside that area, then the mouse event's not being picked up by my super cool panel. All right, well, inside draw rectangle, I can't really do my painting there either, right? I can't, I can't say, hey, let's, let's uh, fill a rectangle because I don't have a graphics object, right? All I can do is set things up so that when paint runs, it will draw a rectangle where I want. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make another pair of variables. I'm going to call them last X and last Y. This is going to be the last position of the mouse. And inside my draw rectangle, I'm going to save the mouse position for later use. So I'm just going to say last X equals X, last Y equals Y. So now when I move my mouse, this code executes it gets the XY coordinates of the mouse, it calls draw rectangle, and draw rectangle will save those in these variables up here. And now inside my paint method, let me comment this stuff out. I'm going to say g.fill rectangle last X comma last Y. And let's just make a 10 by 10 rectangle. All right, so now we're starting to connect the pieces together. Mouse click will call draw rectangle, which will save the x, y coordinates in last x, last y, and then the paint method will use those saved coordinates to draw a rectangle. So this is going to be closer. We got a little rectangle popping up already. When I move my mouse, we're clearly inside the mouse handler, but nothing much is happening. But if I, if I resize the window, hey, a rectangle just appeared. And if I resize the window again, another rectangle appears. And if I resize the window, a rectangle appears here. And the rectangle is appearing at whatever the last XY coordinates were. Which, you know, if I move my mouse really quickly, I can get my mouse out of there before it updates it. And, and there's my rectangle. But, you know, it's not drawing until something causes paint to be called. And then when the window gets resized, that's what causes a call to paint. And so our rectangle gets drawn. So we would like to have paint called as soon as we've, we've updated this XY position. And so we can say repaint. And this is requesting that swing calls paint. And if we do that one call, now we've got a pretty cool program. And so every time that we move the mouse, we go into our mouse handler, we call draw rectangle with those XY coordinates. It updates last X, last Y. And last X, last Y, um, record where the mouse is, and then we make this call to repaint, and that eventually causes a call to paint, which picks up those XY coordinates that we just saved and draws a rectangle there. 
And so we've got an Etch-a-Sketch program, which is kind of cool. And with some odd behavior, because, for example, if I resize the window, everything I drew goes away. Was well, that a feature or a bug? I don't know. All right. So this is this is fun to play with, right? This is this is a quick and dirty way to get something drawing, um, but we're really doing something wrong here. All right. So we've got paint and we've got repaint. But you know, we lost the bevel on our box and we've got this business of when we resize the window everything disappears what what about um, putting the canvas inside of like a, a J frame can we do that uh, we actually are in like another J frame inside this J frame yes I don't know if that's a good thing to do you might be able to, because a J frame is just a component. Um, Sorry, like a panel. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, so it is a panel, right? This is this is a a super cool panel inside a J panel, which is this whole visible area, which is inside a J frame. So our our hierarchy looks like this, right? So there's the J frame. Here's the content pane, which is a J panel. Here's the super cool panel, which is which is just called my board. So we do have a, a panel inside another panel. And it's even showing us a little rectangle here. <laughs> All right, so so I said we're doing something that's not really very, very nice or proper, right? Um, Think about this paint method. What is this paint method doing? It's saying, let's just fill in one rectangle at these coordinates. Really, we should not be seeing those other rectangles. The paint method should describe everything that should be happening when the board is repainted. And since we're only calling fill rectangle once, we should only see one rectangle. And the problem here is the paint method normally does a bunch of stuff. One of the things the paint method does by default is clear the whole panel, set it to a background color. Another thing it does is draw a border if a border has been requested. We're not doing those things anymore because we've changed the paint method and we've said hey the only thing paint should do is fill in a rectangle. And that's why the board's not getting cleared in the beginning. That's why the beveled border has disappeared and so on. So we want our cake and we want to eat it too, right? We want to, to get all the stuff that paint used to do. And then we wanted to do some other stuff. And there's a way to do that. We can use the super keyword and say, hey, first thing we're going to do in here is we're going to call the paint method from the super class. So I'm going to add one line in here. I'm going to say super.paint g. And that's going to clear the drawing area. It's going to draw the border and so on and so forth, right? So this is this is where we're going to use that super keyword that, that we talked about the other day. We're going to say, hey, in the original class, the class that we extended, JPanel, there's a method called paint. Let's execute that method. And we're going to pass it the same graphics object, G, as an argument. That's going to clear the display. It's going to draw the border. And then we're going to say, let's fill in a rectangle at this location. And so this is not going to be as fun to play with, but now we've got, you know, the behavior we expect. We have a little box that follows our mouse around. We've got our border back on the, uh, the drawing pane. And if we move outside, we don't see um, the rectangle, but it follows us as far as it can. 
And so this is a, a legitimate example of, of using um, the paint method and the repaint method and um, methods from the graphics class. And if we can do this, we can certainly, you know, just draw a field of dots at fixed locations. That's just repeated calls to, to fill oval. Fill oval is a way to draw a little filled in circle. And a dot is just a little tiny circle. So we can make a pair of nested loops to fill in the ovals for each of the dots in each row. And then instead of picking up mouse motion, we could pick up, you know, a mouse click and take the XY coordinates and then we can we can do whatever we want. Alright, so questions. This is a lot of stuff. Can you show your paint method again? I yeah. That's the super part of it. Yeah, so so um right there. Thank you. Yeah, I gotta make my font bigger. Um, so, so when you try to change your your preferences, right, you can search for options. Some of these are are pretty unique. Some of them will bring up you know multiple possibilities. But you know, under color and fonts, I don't know what I want to set here. Um, I'm going to try basic or Java. I don't know. Hey, that worked. I'll pay for it later. Something will blow up. But okay, so I got I got bigger fonts in here. Um All right, so questions about that. So, so we can go a number of different places from here. I mean, one option is just to play with this for the next few weeks. Um, suppose we wanted to, to reproduce that behavior we had before, right? What we had before the Etch-a-Sketch program was happening because since we weren't calling the super classes paint uh, paint method we weren't getting that automatic clearing of the panel and so so whatever we drew happened to be there and it would stick around forever until we resized right and when we resized the frame um, some code that fired in response to that said hey let's go ahead and repaint this uh, this super cool panel and and that's clearing out the the background but but right now you know we're just following the the mouse pointer suppose we wanted to restore that behavior we wanted to actually like leave an image of these rectangles really the only way you can do it is somehow you have to write your paint method to draw a bunch of rectangles Right? There's no there's no switch we can use that says, hey, don't don't erase the display, you know, each time that we come in here. I mean we can not call super, but that's not a, a clean way to do this, right? Super's going to clear the screen. If we want to see the last fifty rectangles that we drew, we've gotta somehow call fill rectangle fifty times. Right? And so so how do we do that? Um, well, let's just remember when we call draw a rectangle with an XY coordinate pair, and I'm going to get rid of this print message just to clean up our output. Instead of just saving X and Y in this pair of integers, we should remember all of our XYs.
that have been passed to us. And so, so how can we remember multiple X and Y pairs? Could use a linked list. So let's let's embellish this. Um, and let's draw multiple rectangles. So there's there's a class called point that um, that basically stores an xy pair. These are integers, and it's it's a useful way to treat you know a pair of integers as a single entity, a single object. And so so let's let's try that. Um, Let's make a point called last point, and we'll we'll import that automatically. And then when we when we come down here and we want to save x y, let's um, let's do last point dot x equals x, and then. Last point dot y equals y. And then in our fill rectangle, let's use last point dot x and then do last point dot y. So I'm in VI and I'm hitting escape to get out of the out of insert mode. But because I'm getting these pop-ups, when I hit escape, it's closing those pop-ups. And then if I continue um, typing in commands, I'm still in insert mode. So that's what's going on there. So eventually I'll go into my preferences and I'll get rid of those pop-ups. And I'll get rid of the auto indent and the suggestions and so on and so forth. But for now, we're kind of living with, with something in between um, VI and, and not VI. Um, so, so all I've done is I've changed the way that I'm storing my x, y pair. I'm storing them in a single thing called a point instead of a pair of integers. And that was glorious. So let's go to the first error message. Well, the first error message scrolled off the top. So let's come down here. Exception in Java AWT. Null pointer exception, super cool panel, Java line 13. So I can click on this. It's hyperlinked, and it'll take me right to the line. I know where it is because I've got line numbers on the side. But if I click on this, it's throwing a null pointer exception at last point x equals x. So what's my, what's my issue here? Why am I getting an exception? Because your mouse isn't in the panel when it pops up? Mm, reasonable guess, but it's not that. It's something something more uh, kind of syntaxy with my Java code. Something related to last point. You're not. Uh, did you not initialize it? I didn't construct it. Right, so I declared it to be a point, but but at this point, last point is still null. I have to actually construct it by setting it equal to a new point. So so um, how do I construct a point? Well, I can construct it with you know nothing, or I can pass a pair of integers, or I can pass a point. Right. So if I don't give it anything, it will construct a point um, corresponding to zero zero, and that's probably fine for me. So. I'll just go ahead and I'll say point last point equals new point. And now we should get some some happiness. Right? So we're back to where we were. But by doing this right now, if I wanted to make a linked list of points, I could do that. So let's let's instead of having a last point, um 
let's have a last point list. And this is going to be a new link list angle bracket point. And this will be a linked list of points called last point list and this will be equal to a new linked list of type point and I have to import linked list so I can just hover over that and say import and so now I've got that set up and um, that should all be good to go alright so um, when I save my points when I call draw rectangle and I pass an X Y what do I want to do right add a new point corresponding to X Y to the linked list so I can do um, last point list dot add new point x comma y alright so what just happened in that one line of code a whole bunch of stuff I created a new point a new instance of an object and I initialized its x and y fields to x and y and then I added called I, I sent that to the add method of this linked list which will, you know, do something with sentinel nodes and pointers and who knows what, but will basically make this another element of the linked list. And then I'm going to call repaint. Well, for repaint, what I want to do is I want to basically draw each point, draw a rectangle at each point stored in my linked list. So I'm going to want to iterate which is just a fancy way of saying we're going to make a for loop so I can call the size method to see how many things are in my list and and let's make sure the add method added to the end of the list that doesn't really matter to us right now so um, so let's do this let's call let's uh, draw a rectangle at each point in the linked list Uh, what did we call this? Uh, last point list dot size. And so for each of these things, we're going to uh, fill a rectangle. All right. So how do we get a particular element from the link list? We can use the get method. And that's going to return an object of whatever type of thing is in our list, in this case, a point. All right, so let's, let's do this the one line way first, and then we can break it out. So let's say last point list dot get i, that returns a point, and a point has a method called um, x which will give us the x value of that point and then last point list get element i again that's the same point and call the get y method doesn't it like here oh uh, I don't think get X is part of a point class uh, get X and get Y return doubles well that's kind of interesting um, so I'm just gonna grab X and Y
All right. So a lot of heavy lifting in this one statement too, right? We're, we're using our linked lists get method to get the ith element and we're pulling off the x field of that point. And then we're calling um, the get method again to get that same element back, which is a point and we're getting off its y field. And so this gives us the x, y values of that ith point in our linked list. We'll fill a rectangle at that location. And then we'll go back and we'll, we'll do that for the next element. And we'll do this across all the elements of our linked list. And so if we run this, we've got our drawing program. And that's fine, but it's going to blow up at some point. So why is it going to blow up at some point? Right, we keep adding to this linked list. And so as it's I move not removing anything from the list either. Yeah, our list is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now it's not that much memory and it would probably take a really long time, but I am using more and more memory the longer I draw, right? If this was something that, you know, was being used for multiple days and was doing a lot of drawing, you would be able to observe the memory on your system slowly dropping. And at some point, you know, it would consume too much memory and things would start to fail. And it's it's not quite a memory leak because we are using these old um, values, right? We're redrawing all of these boxes every time. Um, but this is this is not a great way to do this, right? If we really wanted to to be able to draw, you know, for for years like this, because um, we haven't really put constraints on how much memory we're going to use. It's also kind of slow because you're just allocating a bunch of time to every yeah. time to make a block. Yeah, our list is getting bigger and bigger, and and right now, you know, when I I move this, I've got to draw 3,300 rectangles. Well, you know, my whole drawing area is is 400 by 400. So that's that's 160,000 pixels. And my rectangle is 10 by 10, so so you know, at some point this is this is going to be repeating itself. And you know, if I draw back and forth here, I'm re recording all of these positions and drawing rectangles over itself. So if I really wanted to do this, I would probably not be storing a linked list of points. I'd be storing something like an array of rectangles, you know, or rectangle locations, and I'd be I'd be setting a boolean to say draw a rectangle here or don't draw a rectangle here. But you know, it's it's a pretty quick and dirty, fun little example to play with. Um, but we can clean it up pretty easily, right? And you know, again, we don't have that much code in here. We've probably got more comments then we have code at this point. Really all we've done, we've declared a linked list and we add a point to it and call repaint. We call the super repaint, we loop over the elements in the list and we call fill rectangle. Right, so it's really not a lot of code. So let's, let's, um, let's just clean this up a little bit and then we'll call it a week. So let's just keep this many points. I'm going to set max length equal to 50. So um, this is going to add to um, to the end of the linked list. 
And now I'm going to put one more statement in here. I'm going to say if last list point dot size is greater than or equal to max length. And what do I want to do? I want to remove the oldest element from the list. Well, we're adding to the end, so the oldest element would be in the beginning. So I'm going to say remove first. Alright, so this will this will restrict my list to 50 rectangles, and and um, if I add another rectangle, the list becomes 50 or more. Um, maybe I'll make that bigger then. If it becomes more than 50, I'll I'll get rid of the first one. And as long as I know this is the only thing that's going to add rectangles. This will add exactly one rectangle, so when my list gets too big, it will be exactly 51 in this case, and removing the first will bring it back under. But if there were other things that could be adding rectangles, I would probably do this in a loop. I would say, while well, the size is bigger than max length, let's remove the first element. And then if somehow, the next time I came in here, there were 60 things in my list, I'd remove the first 10. But, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that, you know, the only time things are getting added to my list are right here. That happens one at a time, so removing the first should bring me back down to 50 in this case. So now we can run this, and we've got, you know, a crude version of a snake game. And you can see how quickly you can move. And if you go very slowly, your tail gets really small. And if you get fast enough, you'll get gaps between them and so on. All right, so that's, that's you know, nothing directly to do with, with PA4. But it's, it's a lot of the kinds of things that make this work, maybe the kinds of things that you do to make PA4 work. Um, I can try posting this code on the server. I don't know how useful it's going to be because so much of this code is sort of auto-generated. Um, but I can I can post it up on the server, and if if it seems useful, that's cool. But I wouldn't bank on you know being able to go and look at this and sort of make a lot of sense out of it because you know a lot of it we didn't write. A lot of it came from from you know using this design window. And, and doing things over here and so on and so forth. Um, but I'll stick the code up on the server anyway. Um, but, but so definitely, you know, finish PA3, but once you're done with that, start playing around with this. Start, start putting some components together and, you know, do some basic um, putting up a frame, putting up a panel, maybe putting up a button. Um, try to capture mouse events. So, so add a mouse handler right which which again is just you know right click on the thing that you want to capture go to add event handler and pick something you want to capture mouse motion mouse um, events and so on and so forth and if all of that is working great and you've got time and energy and start messing around with painting and and it's this two-step process first you have to make your own version of a j panel and then you have to make your own version of paint inside that um all right that's all i got for today that's that's a ton of stuff to digest um any questions go for it otherwise i'll just say have a great weekend um come by office tomorrow if if you've got questions otherwise i will see you next week all right, thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend. Thanks, good you weekend. too. Goodbye. See ya.